Tonight, Cavalcade brings you a special program in commemoration of Navy Day tomorrow and in honor of 100 years of superlative American naval ordnance. Rear Admiral W.H.P. Blandy, Chief of the Bureau of Ordnance, has something to tell all Americans which you will hear as part of our program. To conduct our salute to the United States Navy, we welcome back to the stage of the Cavalcade Playhouse, Orson Welles. Good evening. This is Orson Welles. Every now and then, an American is awarded the Navy Cross. Doesn't happen often. The the Navy Cross is an honor that means something. They were effectively put out when a man hand. does get one, his citation sounds something like this. In the face of great danger and very large opposition, or in keeping with the finest traditions of the United States Naval Service. In keeping with the finest traditions of the United States Naval Service. Tomorrow is Navy Day. So tonight we thought we'd like to talk about our Navy and its traditions. Well, what about it? How does it come about that we have a Navy and why? Here it is. Let's say the 13th of October, 1775, in the Continental Congress in session. A motion to equip the swift sailing vessel to carry ten carriage guns for intercepting such transports as may be laden with warlike stores for the enemy. Uh, well, 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 what's all that about? Here's a man who wants us to fight on the sea against the biggest and most powerful Navy fleet in the whole world. The gentleman from Pennsylvania. The use of naval force is quite different from the defense of Boston against unjustifiable attacks. An armed vessel is aggressive. To use it is open defiance. I am clearly against any proposition to fight. Mr. Chairman, Chairman, gentlemen, is it any more threatening to fight the enemy on the sea than on the land? What craven timidity is this that would confine our battle to the safe land in the hope that so our commerce will continue unimpeded? Our fight is for the principle, and the principle which will walk the land will sail the seas as bravely. I move the question. Yes, question. Call for the question. I move. Oh. A vote is taken. Motion is passed. It's close, though. Seven colonies, aye, six nay. And so on paper, we have a fleet. We have 13 colonies with 13 flags. 13 colonies, but only one coastline. And where there's coastline, there's ships. And where there is a threat to shipping, there must be a navy. So we take seven ill-assorted merchant vessels. We pierce their wooden sides for guns. We give them new names, Columbus and Cabot and Providence and Alfred. We devise for them a flag. John Hancock? I am John Hancock. What's your business, sir? John Paul Jones, sir. Reporting for my commission. John Paul Jones. Fine, sir. Fine. To be lieutenant on the Alfred. And, uh, oh, I have another mission for you, lieutenant. Here. Flag. To be the standard of the United Colonies at sea, sir. New flag for a new nation. Thirteen strikes. And the canton, this is the rattlesnake of Carolina, coiled around the pine of New England. Don't tread on me. We shall break out our flag with pride, Mr. Hancock, and we shall fight as bravely as our cause is just. And John Paul Jones wrote, That flag and I are twins. Born in the same hour, from the same womb of destiny. We cannot be parted in life or death. So long as we can float, we shall float together. If we must sink, we shall go down as one. Would you hear of an old-time sea fight? Would you learn who won it by the light of the moon and stars? List to the yarn as my grandmother's father, the sailor, told it to me. Harpo was no skulk in his ship, I tell you, said he. His was the surly English pluck. And there is no tougher or truer, and never was, and never will be. Along the lower eve, he came horribly raking us. We closed with him. The yards entangled. The cannon touched. My captain lashed fast with his own hands. We had received some 18 pounds. 
shot under the water. On our lower gun deck, two large pieces had burst at the first fire, killing all around and blowing up overhead. Fighting at sundown, fighting at dark, ten o'clock at night, the full moon well up, our leaks on the gain, and five feet of water reported. The master at arms, loosing the prisoners confined in the after hold, give them a chance for themselves. Our frigate takes fire. The other asks if we demand quarter, if our colors are struck and the fighting done. Now I laugh content, for I hear the voice of my little captain. We have not struck. He composedly cries. We have just begun our part of the fighting. Only three guns are in use. One is directed by the captain himself against the enemy's mainmast. Too well served with grape and canister, silent his musketry and clear his decks. The tops alone second the fire of this little battery, especially the main top. They hold out bravely during the whole of the action. Not a moment cease. The leaks gain fast on the pumps. The fire eats towards the powder magazine. One of the pumps has been shot away. It is generally thought we are sinking. Serene stands the little captain. He is not hurried. His voice is neither high nor low. His eyes give more light to us than our battle lanterns. And toward twelve, there in the beams of the moon, they surrender to us. We won that war. We won our freedom. We still had our coastline. But peace having been concluded, all naval ships are to be sold or given away. We still had our coastline, and presently Congress heard reports like these. The ship Ohio from New York has been captured and carried into Morley. The ship Raven of Philadelphia, bound for Bordeaux, has been taken and sent into Lorient. A privateer of Boulogne has sent into Calais an American vessel, the William. And so we made it official. Be it enacted by the Senate and the House of Representatives in the United States of American Congress assembled, that the President of the United States may be and hereby is empowered should he deem it expedient to cause the frigates United States, Constitution, and Constellation to be manned and employed. The Constitution. Old Ironsides. I tear her tattered ensign down. Who of us didn't remember those lines and reach down into his pocket for a dime ten cents to save old Ironsides? Save old Ironsides from the god of storms, the lightning, and the gale. Our growing seacoast needed old Ironsides back when she ruled the waves. An expanding seacoast meant an expanding navy, meant bigger ships, meant heavier guns. Heavier guns. Now a ship could stand off a mile or two or even three and toss a ball of metal at an enemy halfway to the horizon. An expanding coastline was creating a need. And the need would climax in a naval battle to change the world. <laughs> Sea battles, great names, great stories, the men of war, the Phoenician armed galleys of Tyre and Sidon, the Greek and Persian craft that exchanged the war hug at Salem, the Roman and Egyptian galleys that eagle-like with blood-dripping prows beat each other at Actium, the Danish keels of the Vikings, the mosquito craft of Abathul, king of the Peleus, when he went out to vanquish Archangel, the Venetian Genoese, and papal fleets that came to the shock at Lepanto, both horns of the crescent of the Spanish Armada, the Portuguese squadron that under the gallant Gama chastised the Moors and discovered the Maluccas, the Dutch navies led by Van Tromp and sunk by Admiral Hawke, the 47 French and Spanish sail of the line that for three months essayed to batter down Gibraltar, Nelson 74 that thunderbolted off St. Vincent's at the Nile, Copenhagen and Trafalgar, ferries, war brigs, sloops, schooners, that scattered the British armament on Lake Erie, the Barbary Cortes, captured by Bainbridge, the war canoes of the Polynesian kings, Tamanahama and Pomeri, Virginia Bay and Hampton Roads. Virginia Bay and Hampton Roads. Remember? The Monitor and the Merrimack. Yes, that sea fight changed the course of things. Yes, sir. I was there. Oh, uh -huh. And your name, sir? Dahlgren. Dahlgren? And you were in the Navy? Yes, sir. An admiral. 
Oh, you do, sir. Admiral John Adolphus Dahlgren. I, uh, I developed a cannon. Maybe saw quite a lot of it. Oh, what sort of cannon was it, sir? Uh, smooth one. Streamlined, you might say. And, uh, just to give you an idea of how much they thought of what I did, uh, you know the naval proving grounds they have down in Virginia? Yes. They named them after me. Dahlgren Proving Grounds. Oh, yes, that's right. Yeah. Of course, they, uh, they mispronounce it down there. Dahl Green, they say, but still named after me. <laughs> but um, at Annapolis, the midshipman's armory, they call that Dahl Green Hall. They pronounce it right, Annapolis. <laughs> That's fine. But uh, people don't remember me. Well, maybe now if you'll tell us about the new cannon you developed. Well, sir, um, the guns I developed were mounted on the monitor. I was clever with guns. And uh, the shot... Three times pierced the Merrimax cannon plate. Well, you want to tell us what was unique about your guns? No, no. I don't think it would interest you very oh, much. Oh, no, I'm sure, Admiral. No, no, very much. no, no. It's uh, complicated by uh, triangulation, know. calibration, you know, logarithmic formulae. Very mechanical, mathematical. Very skip. Well, you don't think it could be explained? Well, um... Look at it this way. Uh, before my gun was introduced, the maximum range of our naval artillery was three miles. Yes. Now, today, guns shoot 20 miles. That's right. Shoot a ton of explosive all that distance of that. And your guns made that leap possible. It helps. It helps. The question of ordnance. But uh, don't ask anybody to explain it. It's too complicated. <laughs> I'll take your word, Admiral. We'll just agree that you made a better gun. <laughs> A better gun, so that tonight in the Solomons, tonight off the Guadalcanal, tonight in the zigzagging North Atlantic convoys, the men of our Navy, equipped with arms and armor superlative during the century since John Adolphus Dahlgren, may fight in keeping with the finest traditions of the United States Naval Service. <laughs> Gray sea, or mist green, sun-silvered water, or storm, salt and spray, daylight or midnight, two bells or eight bells, tropic sea or arctic, antarctic or equatorial, the Navy knows them all. Colossal, the Navy, and paradoxical, hairy-chested and many arms, yet glinting its gun barrels with astral Economical precision and split-second timing. Turbid web feet on the open sea. Submarine fins under the sea. Plane wings overhead. Hunting the enemy. Slugging, pounding, blasting. And always chores we got with tenders, oilers, tugs, smoke screens. With harbor submarine nets, mine layers, mine sweepers, torpedo and depth bombs. Heavy chores with endless patrols and long-breathing convoys. Caravans of the sea. In the Navy, you get every snootful of the sea there is. Carl Sandberg wrote that. You probably guessed it. Yes, we launched a Navy to protect our shores, and as our shores grew bigger, there was need for our Navy to keep pace with them. But the day came when our shores had stretched from one to 8,000 miles. The world had shrunk to the span of a long-range bomber. And our Navy has been charged with winning freedom for the waters of the world. Our Navy. Our Navy, strengthened by a tradition of gallantry that's summed up in the immortal lines of a handful of its leaders. For in each time of battle, for each crisis, the captain spoke.
for the American Revolution, for the War of 1812, for the Barbary Pirates, and for the Spaniard at Manila. Their words earned them undying fame. Although at that, you know, I'm not so sure. Oh, excuse me, sir. Your uniform is familiar with the name? Perry. Commodore Oliver Perry. How do you do, sir? What you were saying made me think. And John Paul here... Oh, excuse me. Shake hands with Captain John Paul Jones. An honor. Evening. And Captain James Lawrence. Captain Lawrence, sir. Glad to see you. If you want me, I'll just be strolling around. Good to get a chance to speak. Well, don't go far, Jim. And this here, this is Admiral Farragut. Well, I'm honored, Admiral. And Commodore Dewey. Commodore? I do, sir. Now, then. As I was saying, it seems a pity that when John Paul here, Jim, Dave, or the Commodore, I went around the world fighting hard and winning, too, most always... We should just be remembered because we happen to say something once, maybe in a little too loud a voice. Now, you take me, what I said. We've met the enemy and they are ours. Yes. Now, there's a stuffy, self-conscious remark for you. <laughs> I had to be laconic if it killed me. Sounds as though I was trying to crowd the whole thing into one of those ten-word telegrams and still have room to send President Madison my regards. <laughs> I see what you mean, but... Uh, Captain Jones, I don't imagine you object to being remembered for what you said. What? I've just begun to fight? Pretty melodramatic, don't you think? Well, well, what about me? I don't even remember saying what they say I said. Don't give up the ship. Well, thrown on a banner, proud and treasured, down at Annapolis. But we lost the ship. <laughs> what I said, I can't even repeat over the radio. Oh, uh, what was that, Admiral Farragut? Oh, that business about torpedoes. Oh, yes, uh, yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Full speed ahead and all for me. Who would have thought that simply because I told my gunnery officer to fire whenever he was ready that I'd be famous? All the natural, everyday things to say. As I remembered, I didn't even raise my voice. What would expect me to send him a note? You see, Mr. Wells, this is the point. It seems unfair that we should be remembered by our countrymen simply because of something we said, not because of something we did. If you're carrying on any investigation into the nature of the finest traditions of the United States Naval Service, we recommend you re-examine the idea of heroism. We wish you'd talk about what kind of a hero it takes to be in the finest traditions of the United States Naval Service. Well, there you have the heroes themselves on the subject. Those captains with a flair for the moment's sudden shining battle slogan. Their permanence is the permanence of inspiration for generations of their country's children. And it is good. And it is built on the still harder rock of their solid, deserved fame as fighting men. But without that harder rock, the years might have endowed their heroism with something else. With a false and tricky glitter a dangerous glamour which is no part of the finest American naval tradition. A glamour which is the proper attribute of the misleader, the undemocratic, the fascist hero. Only war carries all human energies to the height of tension and gives this tale of nobility to people. Glamorous Mussolini. Beautiful hunk of fascist man. One group of horsemen gave me the impression of a budding rose unfolding as the bombs fell in their midst and blow them up. It was exceptionally good fun. Glamorous Vittorio, sportsman son of a sportsman father. Our invincible air models will enforce our new order in Europe. Glamorous Goering, his tunic resplendent with tin. War is the father of creative work, the mother of culture, the vital energy and driving force of the life of a state. Glamorous Tojo, who swore to sign the peace in the White House. Mm -mm. Democracy's heroes have no need for glamour. Now their traditions call upon sterner stuff. Are proven when men and officers put into practice the skills in which they've been trained. Time and chance discover instinctive eloquence, pure, as pure as courage itself. Oh, 
Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on On the broad deck of a U.S. battleship, a Navy chaplain is completing divine service. The date, Sunday, December 7th. 1941. Give those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. midnight, two bells or eight bells, tropic sea or arctic, antarctic or equatorial, the Navy knows them all. Colossal, the Navy, and paradoxical. Hairy-chested and many-armed, yet glinting its gun barrels with astronomical precision and split-second timing. Turbine-webbed feet on the open sea, submarine fins under the sea, crane wings overhead, hunting the enemy, slugging, pounding, blasting. And all with chores we got with tenders, oilers, tugs, smoke screens, with harbor submarine nets, mine layers, mine sweepers, torpedo and depth bombs. Heavy chores with endless patrol. Long breathing convoys, caravans to the seas. Yes, in the Navy, you get every snootful of the sea there is. Thank you, Orson Welles. Next week, ladies and gentlemen, Cavalcade presents Madeline Carroll in a new play, To a Farther Star. It is based on the career of Amelia Earhart. Be with us again next week when Cavalcade presents Madeline Carroll as Amelia Earhart in To a Farther Star. The poem by Carl Sandburg heard on this program is from the Road to Victory exhibition now being shown at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. The orchestra and musical score tonight were under direction of Don Vorey. Our script was by Peter Lyon. This is Clayton Collier sending best wishes from DuPont. From New York, this is the National Broadcasting Company. Mm-hmm.